Who is the best indie game developer in the world? You could obviously make a subjective list about the best indie studios around, but that would ruffle a lot of feathers, and you would never be able to create a list that everyone could agree on. What if we made that list objective? And what if we ranked these studios based on their history of producing high-quality games and their consistency? Back in 2021, we created this list for the first time using the same metrics and since then, there have been an overwhelming amount of amazing indie experiences which makes this list a lot different from the first time we did it. It's not a hyperbole to say that every year feels like the golden age of indie games. The term indie casts such a wide net across the gaming industry. You have some indie studios that are only a few people like Megacrit who made Slay the Spire, and on the other hand, you have a studio like Larian who recently made Baldur's Gate 3 who are technically independent, but are much closer to 450 employees. This is a cosmic difference, but for this list, we are gonna try to adhere to the more classical term. Hopefully, this will keep the list tight and focused on the lesser known teams making amazing experiences. We examined over 50 of the best and brightest indie game studios, made sure they were eligible based on the rules that we laid out, and then we rated them against one another to find out who are the top five indie game studios. Before getting into the list, I think it's important to go over the rules. Rule number one, the studio must be independent and privately owned, and while this might sound strange, there are plenty that seem like small indie studios but are owned by much bigger corporations like Campo Santo being owned by Valve, Night School and their recent acquisition by Amazon, and Clay who were acquired by Tencent. Rule number two, no one hit wonders. We are only going to be including studios with at least two games developed. This would eliminate a studio like Team Cherry who have been hard at work on the ultra anticipated Hollow Knight Silk song, but as of right now, they only have one game on their portfolio, which is Hollow Knight. Rule number three, the studio needs to be fairly active, and this means that only studios with at least two games over the past calendar decade are going to be included. Although a decade might sound like a long time, developing games is a long and slow process that takes many years to fulfill the original vision. This means a studio like Play Dead won't be included since Limbo came out in 2010. Rule number four, there will be a recency bias. This means that the last effort means the most and carries more weight towards the studio's final score as this is more indicative of the studio's current skill set. This will be achieved by adding a slight multiplier to the most recent release score of 1.1. Rule number five, this list will be console focused, meaning that the release of a game needs to be on multiple platforms. That means no exclusives, no VR, no mobile or PC only games are going to be included. Rule number six, only studios under 100 people are going to be considered as any bigger and you've technically outgrown your indie competition and you should now be judged against bigger studios. Rule number seven, DLC is a slippery slope and as such, only fully numbered sequels or different games are going to count. This would mean that Dead Cells from Motion Twin would only be one release and Studio MDHR will only have one release on this list since The Delicious Last Course was just an add-on and both of these require the base game to play. Rule number eight, no collaborations. This means that a studio like Yacht Club Games won't be eligible because they only have one release in the past decade that has been solely developed by themselves. Their last two games, Shovel Knight Dig and Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon were collaborative projects. Rule number nine, the game must be a big enough release that it has over 25 critic reviews. This would mean that Deltarune won't be applicable because it only has 12 reviews likely due to its length and only being released in small chapters. Rule number 10, possibly the most important rule of them all, People are human, mistakes happen, and it's almost guaranteed that we missed a studio or forgot to remove or add a game from a studio based on the rules that we just set out. Before we get into the list, I just wanted to take a quick second to talk about our 2024 goals as an outlet. There are plenty of little goals, but the main goal is to hit 15,000 subs, and you can help with that. If you enjoy what we're doing, then consider subscribing, leaving a comment right now letting us know who you think will be at the top of this list before watching the rest of the video, leaving a like, or sharing with a friend that you think might enjoy it. Any or all of these is going to make a big difference in the algorithm. If you're unfamiliar, we are trying to cultivate a positive environment without toxicity, which is evident in the content that always takes a glass half full approach. 
Getting back to the list, all it takes is one amazing game to take a studio from unknown to top of this list or another excellent game in their portfolio, which means that this list could be very different a year from now. But at the start of 2024, here are the top five indie studios in gaming today. We do have one worthy mention. First, we need to talk about Heart Machine. Looking at the list, it seems pretty accurate thanks to some of the formulas that were put into place to create an objective list of the best indie studios. The biggest issue that I have with this list and the score that I disagree with the most is Heart Machine getting a 168.7, which would not only keep it out of the top five, but it would also put the studio around 15th on the list, which seems out of whack. This is why it's an objective list and not subjective because Heart Machine would easily be part of our top five indie studios. Hyperlight Drifter is one of my favorite games of all time and Solar Ash deserves slightly better than the average 77 review score that it got. It was a big departure from Hyperlight Drifter in some ways but in many ways had a lot of the same elements including an incredible vast and desolate world, stunning visuals, excellent traversal, fantastic music and amazing set pieces. The good news is that their new game Hyperlight Breaker will be hitting early access in 2024 and looks to take the best of Hyperlight Drifter and Solar Ash. Ash. Unfortunately, since Solar Ash would still count alongside their new game based on our rules, they likely won't make the list no matter how good Hyperlight Breaker is, which is why I wanted to take a quick second to mention them here. Coming in at 5th place is Cellar Door Games with 179.9. Rogue Legacy came out in 2013 and was near the tip of the spear for the roguelite genre. It softened the harshness of the roguelike genre and added in some overarching progression that remains fun from run to run and subsequently saw a slew of games follow in this formula and the same footsteps. Hades, Dead Cells, Returnal, and Slay the Spire, just to name a few of the more prominent ones. But before Rogue Legacy 2, Cellar Door released Full Metal Furies. This is an ARPG that is playable in either solo or co-op, which seems like the norm today. It has a review average of 82. Steam recent reviews are strong, but like most, I miss this game, and the studio referred to it as a pretty massive failure. Moving on to their most recent game, Rogue Legacy 2 is similar to a band's second album. It includes more of what fans wanted, more traits, more spells, classes, biomes, monsters, equipment, room, secrets, story, and just about everything else that you could ask for out of a sequel. There was always the discussion about game sequels and if more of the same is enough. Usually the answer for most people is yes, but in the case of Rogue Legacy 2, it was a lot more of the same, but almost every aspect was improved upon. Rogue Legacy 2 is fairly simple. Explore, find treasure, make progress, and die. Pick a new heir, upgrade your manor, upgrade your vendors, and then pay Charon all your remaining gold to return to the castle. That's it, nothing revolutionary, but every aspect of this game is fun and rewarding. It captures that special quality of wanting to do just one more attempt. You always feel like you are moving forward thanks to the quest log by updating in the background when you find or complete goals. Coming in at 4th place is Extremely OK Games with 185.2. What used to be Helix Games became Matt Makes Games and is now Extremely OK Games, which is a bold pivot to make after the critical success of Celeste and Towerfall. But this decision obviously shows how the studio has grown over the years from the ideas and talents focused around one person to a much more team-oriented approach. Towerfall obviously didn't gain much attention when it was initially released as an Ouya exclusive, but it would soon be released for PlayStation about a year after, and then many other systems soon after that. It was on console that it gained a warm critical reception and a decent fan following with good success for an indie title. Polygon named Towerfall among the decade's top 25 games, which is high praise considering all of the amazing experiences over the past decade. As much success as Towerfall earned, it wasn't until Celeste that Matt Makes Games was truly put onto the map as a studio to watch. In 2018, Matt Makes Games released Celeste, an extremely tough 8-bit platformer about a girl who must scale a mountain and all that gets in the way being a metaphor for dealing with depression and anxiety. It was a very refreshing and awakening story about the struggles of mental health while at the same time having great visuals, excellent soundtrack, and a near-perfect level design. The levels became increasingly challenging, but always within reach of the skills that the game provided you. Celeste also won Best Independent Game at the Game Awards while also being nominated for Game of the Year alongside others like Red Dead Redemption 2 and God of War. 
Moving on to their upcoming title, when I first saw Earthblade, I wasn't blown away as I was hoping to be when the footage was finally shown from the makers of Celeste. Extremely okay games have created very high expectations due to their most recent release being a huge success. Celeste was one of the best games of 2018. Even though I wasn't enthralled by the reveal of Earthblade, the studio easily gets the benefit of doubt after Celeste. It also doesn't hurt that this time around, the game is moving into the Metroidvania genre. When you combine the genre change, the quality of their last game, and the story that will likely be the focus of Earthblade, there is a lot to look forward to. Coming in at third place is Sabotage Studios with 185.9. When trying to create a hybrid game that blends retro and modern influences, most developers stray too far towards the two possible sides of the spectrum. The first is by changing too much, which ultimately leads to a game that just uses the IP and doesn't evoke the same memories of the original. The second is by not changing enough with a result that feels stuck in the past with limitations and surface deep gameplay. Sabotage Studios are now the proven masters of walking this tightrope between past and present after two excellent games filled with incredible journeys. Sabotage Studios jumped onto the scene back in 2018 with the retro action platformer The Messenger. It was clear that this wasn't just another attempt to cash in on the retro craze as The Messenger showed a studio deeply passionate about the games of yesteryear, but intelligent enough to make the right modern touches. Fans of the original Ninja Gaiden were in heaven with responsive controls that put it in the same class as Celeste and Hollow Knight, along with an 8-bit soundtrack, witty writing, and of course, the moment halfway through the game that displayed sabotage were a studio to watch. Sea of Stars feels like reliving an RPG memory from the 90s as it proudly wears its influence on the sleeve with combat and exploration inspired by genre classics like Chrono Trigger and Super Mario RPG, but also drawing inspiration from adventure games of the era, including Link to the Past with character abilities, dungeon exploration, and puzzles that are always fun to solve as you aren't bound to a grid. Sea of Stars is another shining example of how Sabotage Studios have quickly become the masters of making retro feel modern, and one of the best indie studios around with their ability to transcend genres. Story, art, level design, score, sound direction, combat, progression, puzzles, exploration, pacing, boss fights, and every other element in this game are done to perfection. Sea of Stars was awarded our Indie Game of the Year in 2023. In the documentary about the making of Sea of Stars, it sounds clear that Sabotage is going to continue on the path of making amazing hybrid games that blend retro and modern. As for what genre their next game will be, this is anyone's guess, but it sounds like they are happiest when they are challenging themselves with new ideas. In second place is Supergiant with 187.3. Easily one of the most consistent studios on this list, and easily everyone's favorite indie studio darling, especially after Hades, is Supergiant Games, who have made a great name for themselves in just over 10 years since they were founded in 2009. Bastion, Transistor, Pyre, and Hades have established Supergiant as an elite indie studio. Although the first three entries from the studio are all variations on the action RPG formula, it wasn't until Hades that Supergiant explored a new genre that made the studio a household name. Hades took the roguelite formula, added a deep level of storytelling that unfolds upon each run, and this was unlike anything that the genre had seen before. The main reason for doing another run wasn't about unlocking a new weapon or skill, instead it was to learn more about Zagreus and everyone else around him. It has been said a thousand times already, but the game's combat felt responsive and crisp, the story was engrossing, and the design gave the player plenty of freedom. Hades spent nearly two years in early access where it refined its systems, expanded the story, and sold nearly 700,000 copies during this time. Following this, Hades released as a timed exclusive on the Nintendo Switch, which was yet another excellent choice by the studio. According to GameSpot, within the first three days, Hades sold nearly a million copies. Hades wasn't just a commercial success, as it was also a critical success that would go on to win many awards including Game of the Year from many different award shows and at the Game Awards, took home Best Indie Game and Best Action Game. Hades 2 is supposedly landing in early access in Q2 2024 and looks to build upon the already amazing existing foundation, but this time, you are the immortal princess of the underworld. Expecting anything less than spectacular from Supergiant would be wrong at this point. Coming in at number 1 is Moon Studios with 190.3. Moon Studios is known for their fantastic work on the Ori series. Ori and the Blind Forest was a diamond in the rough that was known as the Xbox One generation. Blind Forest oozed with excellence at every facet of the game. 
It was visually stunning and it's easily one of the best looking Metroidvanias of all time thanks to an amazing art direction. The world was alive with the background being as important as the foreground. Ori and the Blind Forest was much more than just a visually stunning game as the score and the gut-wrenching story worked harmoniously. Despite its cute looking protagonist, Ori and the Blind Forest was emotionally rich. The art and the story would be wasted if the gameplay wasn't outstanding, but it was. The controls and level design were near perfect, the pacing always kept you engaged, and the set pieces that were spiced throughout were a true spectacle to watch, even if you had to do them multiple times. It was released during the Xbox One generation when Microsoft had stepped away from revealing exact sales, but the founder of Moon Studios told GameSpot that the game was profitable within a week of release which led to a sequel and a bump in size from the studio as they ballooned from around 20 people to about 80 based on the success of The Blind Forest. Their follow-up, Ori and the Will of the Wisps, didn't quite make the same splash of the first game which seemingly came out of nowhere but it was another exceptional Metroidvania that added enough new elements and a fresh story to be worthy and was among the shortlist for best game of the year. It was also a great swan song for the Xbox One and it just released mere months before the Xbox transitioned to a new generation. Moon Studios' upcoming game, No Rest for the Wicked, is a big departure from the Ori series that they have become known for. Wicked is a Souls-like ARPG that looks to put their spin on the genre. The studio has said after redefining the Metroidvania genre, our next goal is to revolutionize the ARPG genre. Looking at the final list, it seems pretty accurate. These are the top 5 indie studios that are churning out high quality titles. In our previous list, both Hazelight and Drinkbox were included and this time around they were replaced by Cellar Door Games and Sabotage Studios who delivered some excellent titles with Rogue Legacy 2 and Sea of Stars respectively. Looking forward, Supergiant will likely make a strong attempt for the top spot with the upcoming release of Hades 2 which will likely review closer to the scores of the original. However. Moon Studios won't be a pushover for the top spot as No Rest for the Wicked already has glowing previews. The other big change that might happen with the list is that the teams that only have one game in the past decade or at all might make a strong case for the top 5 or even the top spot. Motion Twin delivered one of the best indie games of all time with Dead Cells which has an 89 average and the long anticipated sophomore game Windblown is due out in early access at the start of 2024. Acid Nerve had a huge hit with Death which released in 2021 and there is a slight chance that they release a new game in 2024. It's also been a long time since we've heard anything from Playdead. In 2016, Inside was released to critical acclaim and their transition to 3D, it's hard to imagine anything but excellence. Lastly, is 2024 the year for Team Cherry to finally release Silk Song? All signs would indicate yes, and if that's the case, they would likely find themselves in a top 5 spot. There are so many amazing indie experiences happening all the time, and I can't wait to see how different this list might be in 2025. With all of the potential for amazing indie games in 2025, the top of this list is going to be very crowded, and it just goes to show you how many amazing indie studios and games are constantly happening. Until next time, remember to be nice to your fellow gamer, but more importantly, be nice to your fellow human.